This week on Cisco and Ebert, thief Martin Lawrence and victim Tim Robbins team up for a big heist and nothing to lose. Jackie Chan returns as a high-flying secret agent in Operation Condor. And Brendan Fraser stars as a modern-day Tarzan known as George of the Jungle. Boy grows into the clumsy Lord of the Swinging Vines in George of the Jungle, the live action version of the animated TV show and one of the big summer movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. They only made 17 George of the Jungle TV shows in the 1960s. They were from Jay Ward, the producer of the Rocky and Bullwinkle series. And all I remember is the theme song, George, George, George of the Jungle. But from this flimsy material, the filmmakers have fashioned pretty funny movie. Here's the running gag, should I say the swinging gag, about clumsy George, who comes to the aid of a cute heiress and her obnoxious fiancé as they hunt for a legendary white ape. Hey, George, George, George is played by Brendan Fraser, who is perfectly cast for the role. Good-looking, buff, but convincing as a doofus. The heiress is played by Leslie Mann, and she's freaked when at George's lair, she finds he has a most intelligent ape as a butler. I mean, why wouldn't an ape read textbooks, and why wouldn't I find myself in a treehouse with room service and a Tarzan wannabe? One of the funniest gags in the film, George's pet dog, who has tusks. <laughs> Come on, boy, come on! Good boy, Sam, come on! Stop, 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 Sit, sit. Good boy! Does every gag work? No. Does every swinging vine gag work? No. But the film does have plenty of good cheer. George, watch out for that! And what I really appreciate about George of the Jungle is the way the filmmakers attempt to break form by having the script kid itself, by acknowledging the narrator, by throwing in a few mature gags and references. It's not a by-the-numbers movie treatment of a TV show like Beverly Hillbillies or The Flintstones. Thumbs up for me on this one. Thumbs up for me, too. And I laughed loudly mm -hmm. when that elephant came on screen. Big time. The elephant named Shep. Right. Who's a dog? When he bounds into the screen, slides to a halt, sits on his haunches, wags his tail, and starts I to know. pant, I it was just one of the funniest things I've ever well, seen. Well, you a know, movie. I mean, somebody's thinking there, and that's yeah. what you oh, appreciate yeah. upon reflection is somebody's trying, not mm -hmm. just putting, not just doing the pilot. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what was wrong mm -hmm. with some of these shows, all yeah. the movies. Uh -huh. They just do the pilot again bigger. This is a you talked about George as a doofus, which he is. Right. But the movie was not made by doofuses. It's exactly. a smart movie about right. a doofus. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next movie. Our next. What an insight! Aren't you proud that you what, can come out? I know. What an insight! Yes, I am proud of myself. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I'm happy that you noticed it. Next movie, our next movie has the rather wicked name Mrs. Brown. Wicked because that is what some of her subjects whispered about Queen Victoria when she developed a great emotional dependence on her horse groom, a man named John Brown. The film opens in 1864 when the Queen is still in deep mourning after the death of her it's beloved consort, Prince Albert. In her sorrow, she has retreated from London to her palace at Osborne on the Isle of Wight, where Brown, her Scottish stablemaster, thinks he knows what's best for her. You have been told repeatedly not to stand in the courtyard unless requested to do so. Yes, ma'am. And why do you persist in doing it? Because I believe Her Majesty's wrong. If ever a poor soul needed some fresh air, it's her. That's Judy Dench as Queen Victoria and Billy Connolly as John Brown. Of course, a commoner should not talk to the Queen that way, but she permits it and gradually a strange, chaste flirtation develops between them, and he becomes protective of her. 
We stayed a little longer than expected with Mr. and Mrs. Grant. It was most agreeable. We were expecting you to return by six. And now I'm back. And we had a wee nip of whiskey. To keep out the cold. Hey. Thank you, John. The Queen's son, the Prince of Wales, resents the way this man, Brown, has taken over the royal household. Well, I'm sorry, but I really do think it's intolerable that the gentlemen of the house should be dictated to by a servant. It's the Queen's decision. Beg your pardon. Mama, I think you should go now. You've tired your mother enough. Gossip spreads throughout the land. The Queen hardly knows her own mind, they say, until this Scottish commoner makes his they wishes known. The Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, journeys north and confronts Brown, who is concerned for the Queen's safety. The danger. I keep telling them, but they don't see it. They're not as watchful as you. Too busy thinking about themselves. The greasy pole. No loyalty. No, um, love. And that's Anthony Sher as Disraeli. I suppose Mrs. Brown is a love story, although presumably no sex is involved. And Victoria was in mourning all of her days for her beloved Albert. Intoxicated by his closeness to the throne, blinded by his regard for the Queen, Brown goes a little mad, and so does she. Mrs. Brown is a fascinating character study and an early candidate for big-time Academy Award Absolutely, nominations. Absolutely, Roger, and certainly a candidate. Now, forget it. It's going to make my top ten list. Okay, it's going to be, have good. to be a record year if there are ten better films than this. Uh, it's spectacular. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I've been asked over the years, you know, are there certain genres that you have trouble with? And I've said sometimes science fiction, because there's always doom and gloom, and sometimes costume dramas, because they always seem to be pretending that they're all Shakespeare in some way, mm -hmm. some arch <laughs> version of Shakespeare. They're not talking. And I believe it's 130 years since th this More story. Less, okay. Yeah. Do you think human behaviors change that much? Emotions change? No. But no, of course no, not. No. But the costume dramas, everybody changes. And what I love about it is Judy Dench's performance is as dead oh, real. I the emotions are as I, contemporary as can be. I disagree with you about costume dramas. I could name a hundred that violate your generalization there. But apart from that, in the case of this film, I totally agree with you. These values are totally modern. Right. And and I and That's a hard easy to identify and a with and universal. Story. And the way that they are both, it's a Victorian age, after all. Right. The way they're both kind of getting around the fact that they really do have a love for each other. Right. And the fact that she's the queen and has the power to do whatever she wants and her advisors are, are aghast and, and are shocked. Yeah. It's a fascinating dynamic that's it's a, there. It's a love story. You know, I, I think of American president, you know, uh, with Annette Bening and, and uh, Michael Douglas. Yeah. I mean, and people love that story uh -huh. and all that. This is better. I mean, this, it's, this is... It, is just as romantic, and uh -huh. it's heartbreaking, and the, the acting is top flight. I will hope this will become a mainstream hit. I doubt it, but I'd love to see it happen. Coming up next, Tim Robbins and Martin Lawrence play the latest buddy team. They join forces to rob Robbins' rotten boss and nothing to lose. Which one did you think was scary? You were scary. <laughs> really? You were scary, too. Oh, come on. You're just saying that. You don't have to lie. Car, keys, wallet, now. Helen, tell her I'm talking to you. Boy, you picked the wrong guy on the wrong day. Come on, there's a truck right there. Tim Robbins having a bad day there, playing a carjacked advertising executive, depressed over the thought of his wife's affair with his boss in the new comedy, Nothing to Lose. And he's also depressed as he's being mugged by petty thief Martin Lawrence. But then they both have an idea. Join forces to do some really big time thievery. Here's the way Robbins makes the pitch. What do you know, Lanky? I know. You go for the big score. One robbery. You're set. News flash, big slim. People with big money, they protect it. So you do a little research. Tim Robbins plots to rob his ad agency boss, who keeps a lot of money in a safe, but other thieves want it too, and they can shoot straighter than Martin Lawrence. Here's some of the film's more forced comic byplay. You shot me. I'm sorry. You don't say you're sorry when you shoot someone. You say you're sorry when you step on someone's toe or you accidentally break their glasses. A good sight gag? When the other thieves threaten Lawrence's life. Don't touch the sheep, please. Don't. No, no, no. No, don't move. Don't move. Oh, gotta move the hand. I really don't think you should be moving right now. I, I think you're moving. I saw Nothing to Lose about two weeks ago, and I haven't thought about it for a single moment since I saw it. It wasn't unpleasant to sit through. Now, is that damning a film with faint praise? Okay, but that's my review. Just faint praise, thumbs down for me. 
Uh, I give it uh, faint indifference. It's, uh, in fact, <laughs> I give it active, enthusiastic indifference. <laughs> this movie was a waste of two hours of my life, and it had some good, talented people in it. Well, that's the Tim surprise. Robbins, that's you know? the surprise. Tim Robbins obviously catching a paycheck because this isn't the kind of picture that I he guess. normally this gets involved in. This is the same uh, director who did the second Ace Ventura picture, and here he's got a couple of gags that kind of work, yeah. and then he has all of this really misplaced social commentary that belongs in a different kind of picture, and by the end of the film, utter indifference is, I think, the appropriate well, response. Well, that's what we both reacted to. When we come back, Jackie Chan survives some incredible stunts in Operation Condor. <laughs>